welcome to the show. I'm your host Faraz Darvesh. Today we are going to discuss a very common question which is often raised about Pakistan. Whether Pakistan is a failed state or not. Well, let's check out the data. Pakistan is a country of 200 million people. Of those, 60% are under the age of 30, which makes Pakistan a very young state. According to IMF, Pakistan is the third fastest growing economy in the world. Among, it is among the top 25. Pakistan is growing at the rate of 6.3% as you could see on the screen. Yes, this is IMF data, not my data. Pakistan is the ninth largest mobile user market. Yes, it has about 140 million mobile users. 50 million people use internet in Pakistan. Yes, the e-commerce is growing at a very fast rate. According to eBay CEO, Pakistan is the fastest growing e-commerce market. Pakistan's retail market is growing at a rate of 8.2%, which is the fastest, fastest growing rate in the world. And then there is a question that Pakistan does not have a female representation. Females do not get equal rights in Pakistan. Well, let's check out the data. Pakistan had a female prime minister 30 years back. Pakistan had a female foreign minister. Pakistan had a female speaker of the parliament. Pakistan had many judges, lawyers. Uh, Pakistan had female uh, military generals. Pakistan had a uh, female pilot, Sharmeen Ubaid Chunai. We all know her. Pa she's a two times Oscar winner. Then Malala Yousafzai, globally known child education ac advocate. And she's also a Nobel Prize winner. And then Pakistan's global uh, brands uh, such as uh, Beacon House Group. Unilever Pakistan, Hum TV Network, Sana Safina's fashion design, uh, designing icon, uh, Alphala Investment, they are all led by female CEOs. So in order to discuss, you know, and, and then discuss this topic in, in depth, uh, I have two distinguished guests with me, our very own Riyaz Haq. And from Pakistan, I have Monis Rahman joining me. Monis had a, uh, had a unique career. He lived in the US, he studied in the US, he, had, he did his ventures uh, and startups in Silicon Valley, California, and then he decided to take a trip uh, to Pakistan, and he moved to Pakistan to do his next startups. Uh, Monis is, uh, is a technologist, he's a business leader, and he's currently a CEO of Rosie.pk, which is biggest job site in Pakistan, which he also found. Monis, first tell me what prompted you to move to Pakistan. You left Silicon Valley where people come to do their ventures, but instead you decided to move to Pakistan. What was the reason behind this? Yeah, you know, I think I, think I was uh, probably one of the uh, earlier ones to recognize and get attracted to the Pakistan opportunity. I've been in the U.S. for many years. You know, I started my career at Intel. I did grad work at Stanford. I had a very good career run in the U.S. Um, I launched my first startup in the U.S. I moved to Pakistan in 2003, you know, in the backdrop of Musharraf era and a lot of hope. We saw transformation happening on the ground. I was attracted as a as an internet. My my main attraction was the abundance of engineering and software talent in Pakistan, and the cost arbitrage of that talent. Doing a internet startup, the main component of cost is your labor, and you know. The amount of money you pay your programmers in Pakistan, I'm doing a back of the envelope calculation, that number was one eighteenth what I could do in the U.S. And we all know that you can create software anywhere in the world. So I moved back to Pakistan and uh, opened up shop uh, in a very very small room of my parents' house. And uh, you know we we launched from there with a team of four people. I was doing a lot of the work myself and coding. I raised a small amount of investment from uh, friends like Reed Hoffman and. Uh, uh, Joe Krause and you know a few a few other amazing individuals. Um, and today we have a team of about 180 employees. We have offices all over the country. We have offices in Riyadh, Al Khobar in Jeddah, Lahore, Islamabad, Karachi. Uh, and the business has taken off because, as you rightfully mentioned, when I came to Pakistan, the number of internet users at that time were about I think somewhere around 2.2 million people and now the number you said 50 it's actually closer to 60 million people and the number of people here now who have smartphones uh, is, uh, is is massive as well about 50 million people have smartphones and about uh, two 
million new people are buying smartphones, um, you know, every year. So that that number is growing at, at a very fast pace. And um, so, uh, Monis, it's a good time to be here, but that's why I moved back. So, Monis, tell me, I mean, what, I mean, when you hear about, you know, Pakistan's image, when people say, oh, Pakistan, you know, bomb blast, you know, suicide bombing, what, what do you, what do you have to say to this? Do you, do you, do you feel that fear in Pakistan? No, I have three kids there and they're young and they're going to school and having a great time. Look, I mean, when you're sitting on that side of the Atlantic Ocean, there's a different perception, I think, of what's going on here in Pakistan. And when I hear this talk about a failed state, you know, I, I smile, I laugh. It's, it's humorous because when you come to the ground and see what's going on in the country right now in Pakistan, uh, it's, it's, it's vibrant, uh, it's, it's amazing, you've got a middle class that's growing, there's prosperity. Um, and yes, you've got some bomb blasts going off, you know, in some areas of the country, but if you look at the rate of incidence of those bomb blasts, it is far less than other tragic accidents happening in the U.S. and other places of the country. So the probability of being blown up in a bomb blast here on the ground in Pakistan, I think, is uh, about 10 times lower than dying in a car crash in the U.S. But the problem is that you hear the worst 1% of the Pakistan story 99% of the time. So all you're hearing is a bomb blast. So it seems like they're everywhere. Right. And um, let me ask you this. Uh, I mean, how difficult is it for you as a business leader to find talent in Pakistan? So I think one of the things that Pakistan is blessed with is the abundance of human capital. We're a country of about 208 million people. Uh, their skill, and you know, I run, um, I run an employment site, a job site. So access to talent is is fairly easy. When you go to very specialized skills that are just evolving in in the U.S., for example, there's a lifetime for an abundance of those skill sets to reach the ground in Pakistan. But if you're looking for software programmers or engineers or people to help with marketing and SEO, uh, there's an abundance of experience here on the ground. The great people. Okay, Riaz, let me take it to you. Uh, Riaz, let me take it to you. You heard what Moniz just said, and you know you have your data. I mean, this this question is becoming common, more common these days that Pakistan is a failing state. How do you react to this? Yeah, actually, the the failed state moniker has become much uh, less uh, frequently used now, because so many people who forecast its demise over the last uh, you know twenty years have all been proved wrong. Uh, I remember, I still remember uh, when the Taliban uh, took over parts of SWAT in Pakistan, the uh, headlines in the United States were screaming that they're only 60 miles away from Islamabad. And there was this guy, David Kilcullen, who used to work for uh, uh, George W. Bush. He said, within the next six months, we're going to see total unraveling of the Pakistani state. So Pakistanis are used to having a lot of very bad negative coverage and all kinds of, you know, the word disaster, the word, uh, you know, failed state, uh, they're, 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 they're used all the time. They have been. Now, some of them are realizing, hey, this isn't, uh, you know, that kind of a country. This is a much more resilient country. Yes, we had a rough patch. I mean, there was a time, as I said, when the Taliban took over parts of Swat. And then what happens? The military went in and cleared them out. And over the last, uh, you know, uh, about four years since uh, about 2013, when uh, the uh, military launched Operation Sarbe Azb, uh, Pakistan's uh, uh, incidence of terrorism has gone down dramatically. And as the security has improved, the investment has come in, and as you just noted, Pakistan has now become the third fastest growing economy among the top 25 economies in the world. And this is IMF. This is IMF. I mean, <laughs> that forecasting is... This is not Real Zagor for Azerbaijan, yeah, Monish yeah, Rehman. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is a fact. So, so all of these people, I, I don't think we're going to hear any apologies from any of these people. They're not going to come out and say we're wrong. But I'm sure that they probably do have a feeling inside themselves 
that they were so terribly wrong about Pakistan. Now there are still people who every time something happens, you know, I just was just talking to you on our way here. You know, we had this unfortunate incident where uh, a little girl uh, uh, was uh, was raped and killed uh, in Kasur. Yep. And then I immediately started seeing these postings on Facebook and elsewhere. See, Pakistan is a failed state. And what these people don't realize is that these things happen happens everywhere. everywhere. I mean, they right. happen in the United States. Is the United States a failed state? They happen in Europe. Is uh, are European states failed states? So I think the there is this this tendency to and, and and unfortunately some of this comes from our own Pakistanis themselves. They tend to accept these kinds of uh, uh, doom day scenario, uh, doom saying, uh, and forecast of, of, of Pakistan's uh, you know failure uh, very readily. I mean they read the news, these newspaper, they they read the headlines, and they immediately say, okay. You know, as TV told you, Pakistan is a failed state. This person died, or this accident happened over here, or that that particular terrorist. I mean, terrorism is a worldwide phenomenon now. Terrorism happens in the United States too. It happens in Europe. It happens in all parts of the world. So why is it that whenever anything that happens elsewhere as well, when it happens in Pakistan, it automatically right, right. qualifies as a failed state? No, no, you know, Pakistan is, is, is growing. I mean, there's there no doubt. What is your projection on Pakistan? What does Pakistan fundamentally needs to do to stay stable? I think the key is, as we have seen in the last few years, Number one, you know, there's, there's this thing called Maslow's hierarchy of needs that is often taught in management schools and in, uh, in, 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 in different kinds of, of classes. The, the basic fundamental requirements are obviously, you know, you have physiological needs. You got to be able to eat and go to the bathroom. And then on top of it, you have the need for safety and security. You want to ha have some sense of security around you. Uh, and then, obviously, there are other things that come on top of it. So as long as we take care of the basics, you know, make sure the people are properly fed, they, that they uh, have, uh, you know, basic hygiene, those facilities, and, and they have some sense of security, uh, the rest of it is, is going to come. Because after all, you know, we have, as you just noted, yep. we have uh, a lot of very young people. We have about 135 million millennials. There was a report I saw. Uh, you know, this was a Euromonitor report that was uh, carried by uh, Bloomberg. 135 million millennials, and these uh, people uh, are better educated than their parent generation. They are far more ambitious than their parent generation. They can transform uh, the, the country. So, Moniz, let me take it to you. You know, when you're, let's say you have a new startup you're starting and you need a venture capitalist from Silicon Valley to be investing in your company, do you feel the heat? Do, do they come and ask you, you know, I don't have a confidence on Pakistan. I mean, how, how do you work this through? Look, you know, at the end of the day, there is um, a perception gap and it's massive. The notion of uh, being a failed state is is absurd and you realize it's absurd the moment you land on the ground in Pakistan and you breathe the air and you see what's happening around you but when you're far far away and you're reading headlines of news and you're using these indicators that as I said again it's a worse one percent of the country that you're hearing over and over again um, you tend to feel insecure um, I've raised VC funding from uh, amazing VC funds globally, including in the U.S. And one of the things I've found is the hardest VCs to generally raise funding from our U.S. VCs because the perception gap between the U.S. Uh, and the reality of the ground is probably far greater than any other nation I've encountered in the world. For example, if you look at people in East, East Asia, in Europe, in the Middle East, they're a lot closer to what's happening on the ground. But we have raised investment from quite a few funds. Uh, including U.S. funds, and at the end, the numbers trump perception, and the numbers are very strong and powerful. You know, you spoke about um, the country being in the top 25 in terms of GDP crossing a trillion USD, uh, PPP adjusted, of course. The reality is, according to SBP, State Bank of Pakistan, our official economy, the GDP that you hear, is actually half of the actual GDP. So about 50% of the economy is operating in the official zone, and about 50% is unofficial. It's in cash, undocumented. So the economy is actually twice as large as what you think it is. Uh, 
there's there's tremendous vibrancy right now, and I'll give you a few examples on the potential of the country. Yes, a huge growth going on right now in e-commerce. Everybody has smartphones. So, example is my cook has a smartphone, my driver has a smartphone, my chokidar has a smartphone. The other day I was lying in bed and I was going through my Facebook news feed and I saw a recipe there that sounded really appetizing. So I tagged my cook on the recipe, M. Jamshed, M. Jamshed. He's got the same first and last name. And I forgot about it. I came home from work and he had made this amazing dish. And I totally forgot I tagged it. Uh, and so that's kind of the power of the internet. You would never have imagined being able to tag your cook on a recipe in English on Facebook and have it made at the time that you got back home. Uh, of course, he made me another dish the next day because he thought I, I tagged him on the video that came afterward, which I didn't. You know, this is this is a part of the learning curve. But um, on on another note, from the top to bottom, you've got a population now that has a disposable income that's growing. We've got a middle class that's growing very very fast. We've got interactive services now on smartphones. 3G is everywhere. We were late uh, to the game from the 3G, but now you have people experiencing interactive mediums, internet for the first time because it's a personal screen, they've got a cell phone. Right. They skip the laptops, they skip the computers, the desktops, not put up the laptops. Only 15% of adults in Pakistan have accounts at banks. Only 15%. That's amongst the lowest in the world, God is like 92%. And the reason is because you have to erect these bank branches all over the world and all, all this infrastructure and ATM machines well, now what's happening is the fintechs are allowing you to open accounts on your phone in this country, Pakistan, just on your phone. So people are getting included into this financial world. So another example of my book and my talk, all of them have a mobile wallet on their phone and they're transacting with each other. I looked at my cook's phone the other day, he had more cash in his phone than I did. And I said, how come you have so much cash? He's become a banker for the neighbors. So all of the servants in the neighborhood use him to transfer cash, and now they're starting to get smart and saying, wow, let's open up our own account on our own phone. So, so you know, these are the things happening on the ground, which I think you can not feel far over there when you're hearing the worst headlines over and over again. Right, Moniz, two questions for you. First, tell me about the startup culture in Pakistan. Uh, tell the audience what the, you know, the, I know there are plenty of startups happening in Pakistan and startup culture is developing uh, rapidly. Uh, and then what is your projection? When I was in Pakistan three months back and what I heard from people that, hey, until 2013, the business was not doing well. It was bad. But now since the security uh, situation has improved, the real estate, the business is doing much better. Uh, what is your projection and tell us about the startup culture? Look, there are several things that are going in Pakistan's favor. This is the best time to be a startup in Pakistan. Why? Because the number of individuals who can interact with your software, your platform, your venture, your idea has dramatically skyrocketed. About 60 million people now are connected to the internet in Pakistan. That number has grown in a massive way. So you have an instant audience. We all know the beauty of the internet and not having to spend an infrastructure and having a distribution that's instant. At the same time, for the first time in Pakistan now, we've solved the payments problem and that's being solved every day at, uh, at a faster rate where you can actually pay from your phone or your computer without having to do a COD, even though COD is still very widely accepted. But that problem is also going away. One of the other assets we have, I think, which is a real blessing, we don't uh, understand how huge of an asset it is, we have a computerized ID card. So about 95% of adults have a computerized ID card in this country right now, which means that you can authenticate ident um, identity real time online with Nadra. This goes a long way in creating trust in online transactions. So everything is in a microwave. It's, it's probably the best time to be a startup. And at the same time, there's been a cultural shift. When I came back uh, in 2003 to Pakistan and doing a startup, Everybody kind of you know just frowned at me, saying, "Well, you're a computer engineer. You've done your grad work at Stanford. You were in the U.S. You came back here to do what? Like a, a startup out of your house? It was almost a shameful thing being an entrepreneur back in 2003. Today, I think the incubators and of course the environment have done so much to create excitement in being a startup founder. We have uh, you know Plan Nine. You have a Nest.io. You have Lums. You have the um, NIC in Islamabad. They opened an NIC over here." lots of incubators, and investment has started to flow in. 
So it has become sexy again to be a startup entrepreneur, and we're seeing the brightest kids, um, you know, kind of okay. um, yep. creating their own ideas and ventures. Yep, Riaz, let me take it over to you. You heard what Moni just said. Well, I mean, what is your projection? Yeah, let me actually talk a little bit about some of the issues, uh, particularly macro economic issues that Pakistan needs to seriously deal with. One of the issues that Pakistan has had as a chronic issue is low levels of investment. And the low levels of investment are mainly because people don't save as much. The savings rate in Pakistan is only about 15% versus about 30% in Bangladesh and about 40% in India about 50% in China. Unless you can save and invest, it is very hard to sustain growth. So one of the things that, they, that, that the Pakistanis have to do is learn to save a little more. Now, my hope is that as a result of the demographic dividend that Pakistan is expecting, what demographic dividend means that the number of people entering the workforce is larger than the person the percentage increase in the population so when there are more people working within a family let's say okay. there's a there's a household of uh, six people in that household if you have only one person working that's a problem because that one person basically has to earn to take care of the other five and, and, and himself or herself if instead of one you have two people or three people working in that household you have more income coming in and then you can save some more and that basically creates the investment pool mm. uh, that the country needs so that's one of the areas that they need to focus on the second area that is important is that Pakistan continues to have issues with the current account deficit our exports are not keeping up. In fact, our exports have declined in the last few years. As, and our imports have increased. As a result, our deficit, trade deficit has increased. And the problem that happens when you have a big def trade deficit, when you're you know, selling very few things to other countries and buying a lot of stuff from mm -hmm. other countries, that gap has to be somehow managed. One of the ways Pakistan manages that gap is through the remittances. The Pakistanis overseas, people like you and I, and those in Saudi Arabia, and the Gulf states, and Europe, send in about $20 billion. So that helps the Pakistan uh, uh, current account deficit a little bit because they can make up for some of that. But they still need to figure out how to become more competitive as an exporter, create products, understand foreign markets that they want to export to, create products that they can sell and do it competitively, meaning they need to build those products at a lower cost than the competitors and do it better at a higher quality. Now, my hope is that as a result of CPEC, the uh, Pakistan-China, Pakistan Economic Corridor, with the energy problem solved, okay. if you have plenty of energy, that actually makes you move. Because let's say you have a plant, that plant only works one shift because of lack of energy. Uh, lack of electricity. If you can operate that same plant in two shifts or three shifts, you reduce the cost per unit of production. Mm. Then you have the issue of infrastructure. If it takes you forever to move stuff from one place to another, your okay. supply chain is broken. And then that makes you uncompetitive. Okay. So these are some of the bigger things that Pakistani yeah. government needs to worry about. So they don't have to go back to IMF every two or three or four years. Which, so domestic right. economy is doing fine, but we have to worry about our external accounts. We need to make sure that we are producing and exporting enough of these things so that we can afford the imports coming in. Okay. Moniz, let me take it to you. First, tell me how much do you agree with Riaz? And then my question is, you know, a lot of time when I talk to my friends, they said, yes, we want to move to Pakistan. We want to do business there, but I have to pay the bribe at every corner. There are obstacles at every corner of Pakistan. You know, there is no political instability. You know, you have Imran Khan uh, closing down the, uh, the capital. Then you have these, uh, you know, cl clerics closing down the capital. And then that's, you know, this, there is no instability. And then the bribe issue. How much of that do you face in Pakistan? Look, you know, again, this is a matter of the worst 5% propagating into 
99% of what you think is going on, I think, in Pakistan. I, I moved back in 2003. I didn't know anybody here. Uh, you know, I was, I was a complete outsider in Lahore. The first thing I did when I moved back was I bought a map to figure out how to move around in Lahore. Um, when you first come, it seems like everything is challenging. How do I get a driver's license? How do I do this? How do I do that? And so doing things in Pakistan can be 10 times harder than doing things in the U.S. or they can be 10 times easier. And, you know, at the stage I'm at now, I'm very spoiled here. I can get things done very quickly on a phone call that I would have spent a lot of time to do in the U.S. So you have to learn the system, and that's part of being an entrepreneur and uh, being a networker is very important in Pakistan. Bribery, it's everywhere. It's in India, it's in the U.S., it's in the Middle East, it's everywhere. Um, it's no more pervasive here than I think what you would expect in any other emerging area of the world. And you can easily avoid having to get stuck in that route. Now, if you're doing a lot of contracts with the government, etc., then you would probably expect to face more of that. But you know what? You'd probably expect to face more of that even in the U.S. You don't hear about it as much. So I think you can very efficiently operate in Pakistan without having to get stuck in, you know, bribery and all, all this uh, this this whole speed money issue. But I just want to come back to what Riyadh said, and you know, I I agree um, in terms of uh, what we need to do as a nation. But I want to add a little bit more depth to it. For example, when we talk about India and Bangladesh, and you talk about a savings rate, you also have to realize that the percentage of banked adults in India is like fifty three percent, and it, now in Pakistan, it's about 15%. So financial inclusion will go a long way in increasing those indices, uh, especially when it comes to savings and you know other numbers. Only 4% of people in Pakistan have ever obtained a loan from a financial institution, a formal financial institution. And loans for individuals and SMEs are critical to kind of bootstrapping the economy. A lot of organizations are just bootstrapped for cash. If they could have another 5,000 a month, they could buy more product to put on the shelves, and they could do more sales. So there's there's a big problem where uh, there is an availability of loans and debt, and there's a financial inclusion problem you know, at the same time. So um, when you look at what's going on holistically and the opportunity in the country, when I came to Pakistan and tried to talk to a VC and tried to tell them to invest in Pakistan, I had to sell the Pakistan story. It was easy to do a sale on what I was doing as a business and my growth, but trying to sell the country was very hard. Now that's actually switched around. Uh, VCs who've invested in emerging areas of the world globally realize that Pakistan right now is one of the most attractive emerging areas in the world to invest. If you're looking at a fintech, this is the market to be investing into because everything is set. It's a perfect storm right now. The financial inclusion is low. The loans are low. But we have everything we need in terms of the education. We have the uh, ability of most people to speak English. We have the internet enabled. We have Nagra ID card. So um, it's it's really an exciting time for the country. Okay, Riaz, closing remarks. Yeah, I think the there's a lag between uh, perception and reality, uh, and perceptions actually take much longer to change than reality but eventually they do. So I think if the reality continues to change as it is for the positive, right. Pakistan continues to show higher growth and Pakistanis continue to perform in, ter in, in terms of uh, economic uh, achievement, okay. then I think that that perception will change and the security situation will also. For example, one of the things that I just noticed is uh, that Pakistan's uh, tourism industry is booming now. Mm. It's about a $20 billion industry and one of the reasons why it has, uh, uh, it is booming is because some of the, the older perceptions about Pakistan's lack of security are uh, gradually going away. The British government, for example, is no longer telling their citizens not to go uh, to Pakistan. Uh, and uh, some of the data suggests that the bookings, particularly from Britain, I was reading this uh, today in Financial Times. The bookings of the Brits, this is one particular mm -hmm. tour uh, company, the bookings for the Brits coming to Pakistan are up 100% for this year. Right. So, it's, 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 so safety and security has yeah, a lot to do with this. That's a big yeah. issue. So right. now, now tourism is a $20 right. billion dollar industry right. now and is growing uh, rapidly. So I, I think it's very important that we continue to improve our perception. Then Pakistani government has done some effort. For example, they had this campaign 
Brand Pakistan campaign, Emerging Pakistan. They ran these right. big banner yeah. ads on buses mm -hmm. in London, in Jakarta, and several other places, which are helping shape perception okay. uh, and improve perception of Pakistan. So mm -hmm. all of the, then the, another thing that I heard today, they have actually eased the visa requirements for tourists. Right. They said for up to 30 days, you don't need a visa. You can get that at the airport. Right. So those things right. are good, are important things that are happening. So, Monis, closing remarks, let me take it to you. When you meet the political leaders of Pakistan, what do you tell them to improve the image of Pakistan? Look, I mean, you know, realistically expecting them to do anything and having any outcome is 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 not very practical. It's, it's beyond their ability, beyond kind of uh, their their immediate agenda. So I think the image of Pakistan, you know, it's like uh, trying to boil the ocean right now. There's so much stigma associated with the Pakistan brand. And uh, I've just stopped trying to improve the perception. You know, I think you just have to play your own game and your actions and the results and the numbers speak louder than any ad campaign that you can run. Um, one thing I do want to add is we have powerful dynamics that are going to propel Pakistan forward regardless of what's going on. And those powerful dynamics are, you've got a middle class that's growing amongst the fastest in the world. There's a purchasing power. This is uh, creating growth in the retail sector. This is creating growth in the tourism sector. So the number of people this year who've gone up to Skardu with their family mm. is probably a few orders of magnitude than what was happening five years ago. So people in Pakistan are spending more. They're spending more online on the internet. This is all coupled with a population that's very young. So every year, 2.5 million people are onboarded into the job market. They go on to buy motorcycles, they go on to buy cars, and they go on to buy homes. So a disproportionate number of a population that's very large is uh, becoming purchasers. This is what's driving land prices up. You know, if you say, well, why is real estate doing so well? Why is it growing at a rate of 100% a year at these astronomical rates? It makes no sense. Well, it does make sense because you've got this population that's being onboarded to purchasers and you've got a supply that's still very, very small. So real estate is still a great investment in the country. So as a combination yeah. of all of these things happening, and then you have CPEC, which is really, uh, you know, kind of a big bang. It's like an economic kind of big bang with all of this investment and increased infrastructure in terms of the roads and the supply chain improvements, etc. that's happening. The future is very bright. What is the threat? Well, the threat, as Riaz also pointed out, is if Pakistan keeps entangling itself in this uh, geopolitical uh, game, like a chess game, essentially, where you know there's a war on a terror in Afghanistan, Pakistan's participation in that has cost us dearly. And I don't think people realize that we're really a victim of this. Right. People portray us to be one of the instigators of it. We've got a huge burden of the Afghans that we host in Pakistan, the terrorism, that results as a result of all of the armaments going into Afghanistan and into this war. India has been very active over there on the border. So as an entrepreneur, as a Pakistani who lives here, I'd love to just close off all, all of our borders and focus internally. So I think that's been a liability. <laughs> right. Right. Thank you, Moniz, uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Riaz. Audience, you ha uh, heard the opinion of two experts, uh, especially from Moniz, who is living practically in Pakistan and who has done the ventures in Pakistan. He's a successful business leader in Pakistan. So, I mean, there, there, there is a lot of negativity uh, about Pakistan in the media, but, you know, you have to look at the data. You have to look at the progress Pakistan has made. Uh, until next week, goodbye.